struggle for Columbia River Indian people to exercise their creator-given rights, their treaty-protected fishing rights, seems endless. In spite of the solemn treaty promise of the United States government, in spite of more than 100 years of litigation, the opportunities for tribal people to take salmon and steelhead from the Columbia River system continues to decline. It is important to note that the tribal fisheries used to be year-round. The tribe and its members used to begin fishing in the early springtime and would celebrate with a great feast of Thanksgiving. They would fish throughout the summer on the abundant uh, summer Chinook known as the June hogs. They would fish through the fall fishery, begin putting food away for the uh, long winter months. They would fish for the uh, sockeye that would arrive a little bit later, and the abundant steelhead. What the Indian people found and enjoyed for the approximate 35,000 years of their existence was that there was plenty of salmon to go around from the smallest mink to the bold and majestic eagle to every human being that relied upon the salmon. In terms of numbers, the estimate is approximately five million salmon that we used to harvest. The run sizes, however, were anywhere from 10 to 35 million. Those phenomenal runs are gone. Hatcheries now produce 80% of the salmon runs, which stand at two and a half million. The Treaty Indian catch for 1992 was about 94,000. That's less than 2% of what it was 150 years ago. Beginning in the late 1800s, as non-Indians developed gigantic fisheries and turned the rivers to other uses, the tribes watched their catch steadily decline. They have seen their fishing for ceremonial purposes and subsistence purposes reduced in some cases to almost nothing. They have seen much of their commercial fishing eliminated altogether. In 1964, because of dwindling runs, the tribes began to eliminate the commercial fishery on Summer Chinook. In 1977, because of conservation need, the tribes eliminated the spring commercial fishery. By 1988, we were being asked to eliminate the sockeye fishery. Our sole remaining commercial fishery today is the Falchinook. And we find that as uh, the promises uh, of uh, fulfillment of treaty reserved rights that fish would always be there, we find that these are becoming very empty promises, as empty as our nets are. In the 1840s, European Americans began to stream into the Northwest along the Oregon Trail. To further encourage migration, Congress passed the Oregon Donation Land Act of 1850, giving free acreage to those who would settle in the Pacific Northwest. But legally, the land still belonged to the Indian tribes who had lived here since time immemorial. The United States needed to gain title to that land in order to give it away. So the government negotiated treaties throughout the Northwest. In those treaties, the tribes ceded title to most of the land in exchange for a reservation, a small amount of money, a few considerations, and for many of the tribes, the guarantee that they could exercise certain of their inherent rights forever. Four of those treaties negotiated in June of 1855 were with the people who fished the Columbia River and its tributaries. They were the Yakima, Umatilla, Nez Perce, and Warm Springs treaties. Bearing in mind the, int the purpose and the intent of the treaties that were made, uh, our people that negotiated the treaties, our chiefs, they were very much uh, concerned about the future of our children, the future of uh, preserving certain species of salmon, preserving uh, certain practices that were used. Um, as, as we look about, to, about us today now, we can uh, just about realize what 
our chiefs were thinking in, in 1855 when the treaties were being made. At the time of the treaty making with our tribes, there was a engulfing of this land by many people foreign to this area. And our leaders recognized the development, recognized the foretelling of the elders, the way the songs and the teachings go. We were foretold by our elders before these developments came about of things to happen. And indeed, when the land began to be populated and other peoples came to this area, they saw that those elders that spoke in generations before were telling the truth. At that particular time, my great-grandparents and many great-grandparents were also aware that they had to violate their law in order to live under the red and white and blue. You can't sell the land, but yet they had to, they had to sell it. They had to sell it, uh, looking down a gun barrel, uh, knowing they would be ex Many of the people felt that we should fight till the end, you know, to be exterminated. Um, but the other ones were saying, you know, well, let's exist with what we can, with what we have left, you know, then we will be. Because we also owe our grandchildren the right to live, you know, even though it's going to be lived in violation of our law. Yeah. Our people have met three days in the Dallas. And they finally came to an agreement. They said, yes, we had better agree to that so-called, something called treaty. Because if we don't, we know that we can't push the uh, Europeans away and send them back or, or keep them from coming to this country. We know they're coming. We, I got to admit that. And therefore, we got to have some way of protecting what rights we got here. And by this agreement called treaty, it's the only way we're going to protect what agreement. So let us sign it. That was the agreement they came to. Those treaties were ratified four years later by the Senate. Each of them contains a substantially identical clause that guarantees the tribes the right to fish both on and off their reservations. The importance of that guarantee to the tribes was and is impossible to overestimate. Government representatives clearly understood that without the assurance of perpetual fishing rights, there would have been no agreements. That's confirmed by the sworn testimony of a witness to those negotiations and by minutes taken at the Walla Walla Treaty Council. Tribal negotiators understood that they would keep the right to fish as they always had, where they always had. That is evident given the circumstances at the time. It was commonly understood that the community in the Northwest was comprised primarily of Indian people, and it was commonly understood that the practice of fishing was almost exclusively Indian people fishing. The early settlers had not yet developed the practice of commercial fishing, and thus, when we fished in common, the Indians were fishing primarily 99% of the time, and the non-Indians were fishing perhaps 1% of the time. That is based both upon the culture that the Indian people were used to thriving upon and the development of the agriculture and other communities that the settlers were busy developing. But the non-Indian population grew quickly, and it would take only about 30 years for the treaty-guaranteed fishing rights to be tested in court. In 1887, the Supreme Court of the Washington Territory ruled in favor of the Indian fishermen's position that the effect of the words in the treaty was to reserve to the Indians the right to enjoy all these fisheries as they had heretofore. But almost ominously, the opposition argued that the treaties gave the Indians only the same fishing privileges off the reservation as non-Indians, that the treaty guarantee meant nothing. In spite of four Supreme Court rulings to the contrary, the states of Oregon and Washington would cling to that position for at least 85 years. During that time, the states established a tradition of applying their regulations in a way that clearly discriminated against the Indians. 
By the late 1960s, the situation in much of the Northwest had become intolerable for Indians who practiced their fishing rights. Some fished in protest of state regulations and were arrested. One particular arrest would lead to the landmark fishing rights case, So Happy versus Smith, which became United States versus Oregon. Indian people were feeling tremendously frustrated. They were feeling violated by the state's unilateral assumption of jurisdiction over treaty reserve fishing rights. Demands were being made by Indian people for the states to respect these treaty rights. David so happy knew he would be arrested for fishing in violation of Oregon state regulations. But his belief was that the state of Oregon did not have and should not have regulatory authorities over Indian treaty fishing rights. Because of that arrest, the tribes became involved to protect their treaties. The United States government, represented by the United States Justice Department, intervened to assist the tribes by carrying out their trust responsibility, overseeing the protection of these treaty rights. The historic task of sorting out the law and issuing a comprehensive opinion about Indian fishing rights fell to Federal District Court Judge Robert Baloney. The opinion he issued in July of 1969 remains the cornerstone of Indian fishing rights interpretation nearly 25 years later. This was a suit for a declaratory judgment that asked me to declare what the law was. Each side was allowed to tell me what they thought the treaties meant. I made my ruling. I published it in this book, which is in the law library, every law library in the United States. It became the law when I signed my name to that opinion, and it still remains the law of the land. Judge Baloney's decision was the most comprehensive analysis done by a federal court to date of the meaning of those rights and the limitations on the power of the states to regulate them. Embodied in that decision are some long-standing principles identifying the source of Indian fishing rights. First and foremost is that the tribes, just like the United States, were sovereign governments. Treaty makers recognized that tribal peoples had a very disciplined way of life, that the discipline was interwoven into the way that tribes as governments conducted themselves. They also saw the values that were inherent in tribal government ethics. Those ethics went back to the beginning of time. It was that spiritual presence called sovereignty that forced us to comply with these basic laws that would govern us until the end of time. Historically, prehistorically actually, uh, Indian tribes uh, exercised aspects of uh, governmental power that any international governmental power exercised. Uh, these are powers that uh, reflect a governmental authority and include things like the power to wage war lawfully, uh, to control territory, to control resources, to enact laws and regulate people's activities. The 1855 treaty itself was an act of sovereignty in that it was one government negotiating and entering into an international agreement, essentially a treaty nation to nation with another government. That is an act of sovereignty. Recognizing that Indian tribes were sovereign also meant recognizing the rights that sovereignty confers. Among them is the right to take fish. So when the treaties were negotiated, the tribes simply kept what they already had. The fishing rights that were reserved in the treaties were not rights that were granted to the tribes by the United States or by anybody else. The rights to take those fish pre-existed the United States government, um, uh, the formation of this country, and, and everything else. 
In recognition of their sovereign origin, Judge Baloney ruled that when the United States guaranteed tribes the right to fish at their usual and accustomed sites in common with the citizens, it was promising the tribes a fair and equitable share of the harvest. He affirmed the supreme status of treaties in the American legal system by ruling that states do not have the power to ignore treaty promises to the benefit of interests it prefers to support. Before my ruling, the state afforded treaty Indians only those rights which it afforded all others. It denied that the treaty gave uh, Indians any right not possessed by non-Indians. It prohibited the use of traditional uh, fishing gear, which was favored by the Indians. It promoted sports fishing and commercial fishing without providing for Indian fishing. It established closed seasons above the uh, Bonneville Dam where Indians usual and accustomed places are located. At that time, uh, the states of Oregon and Washington were managing the Columbia River uh, in a fashion that while allowing the Indian people some fishing time uh, had a very unusual uh, and unique aspect to it in that they allowed the non-Indian fishermen uh, who harvested in the lower portion of the Columbia River uh, to catch all the fish before they reached the Indian fishing grounds. Uh, and at the same time, paying lip service to their um, claims of supplying fishing time to the Indians while really not providing them with any uh, benefit uh, because all the fish had been caught uh, in non-Indian fisheries before they got to the Indian people. The U.S. versus Oregon decision made it clear that treaty tribal members do have special fishing rights. They can take salmon at their traditional upriver sites using the gear of their choice without being arrested for it. But that doesn't mean that Indians can fish without any state regulation whatsoever. The U.S. Supreme Court had previously ruled that states do have the power to restrict Indian fishing for conservation purposes. To clearly define the limitations of the state's authority, Judge Baloney established these criteria. First, the regulations on Indian fishing must be the least restrictive possible while still ensuring perpetuation of the salmon runs. Second, treaty Indian fishing must be considered as separate and distinct from non-Indian fishing and not necessarily subject to the same regulations. And third, states must regulate all fishing so that treaty Indians can take a fair and equitable share of the harvest. With that, Judge Baloney had ruled that the states could no longer use the conservation argument as an excuse to discriminate against Indian fishing. The United States vs. Oregon is printed in this book. It's 300 and, volume 302 of the Federal Supplement, West Publishing Company. And uh, surprisingly, how much you can find out by reading the opinion itself. Uh, so many people who suddenly become experts on this uh, don't bother to read the, the opinion, and that's why they come out with some of the crazy ideas they come out with. But at that time, 25 years ago, this is what I wrote. It is clear that the state has the full and complete power to regulate all kinds of fishing, including the Indian fishery, to the end that the resource is preserved. There's no reason to believe that a ruling which grants the Indians their full treaty rights will affect the necessary escapement of fish in the least. The only effect will be that some of the fish now taken by sportsmen and commercial fishermen must be shared with the treaty Indians, as our forefathers promised over a hundred years ago. The biggest effect, and I think the biggest victory for the tribes, was that it uh, confirmed the validity and viability of the treaty rights. Um, up to that point in time, the battle over those rights had been pretty much piecemeal, and here was a fairly uh, comprehensive uh, victory from the tribe's point of view. Uh, from the state side, I think that was the first uh, indication that they 
had ever received that this was going to be a situation that they were going to have to adjust to and accommodate. Uh, they didn't actually for some years after that and there was uh, continued resistance to uh, the existence and exercise of treaty rights. But uh, that surely and clearly was the first uh, uh, major indication they had received that this was going to be a permanent ongoing situation that they were going to have to deal with. Because of the variations in annual run sizes, Judge Baloney could not calculate exactly how many salmon each group should take. Therefore, to make sure his decision was fairly implemented, he retained jurisdiction, which the Federal District Court of Oregon has to this day. Though he had clarified a great many things, Judge Baloney did not specify what a fair and equitable share was. That would be left to Judge George Bolt to determine in the Puget Sound fishing rights case, United States versus Washington. In 1974, Judge Bolt ruled that treaty tribes could take 50% of the harvestable salmon runs destined to pass their traditional fishing sites. Judge Baloney soon applied that formula to the Columbia River. These rulings were not popular. Judge Alfred T. Goodwin wrote, except for some desegregation cases in the South, the district court has faced the most concerted official and private efforts to frustrate a decree of a federal court witnessed in this century. By that time, my friend Judge George Bolt had applied my rulings to the Puget Sound. The uproar in Washington was unbelievable. He was hung in effigy in front of the U.S. courthouse in Seattle. He was harassed. Some thought he was a traitor to his own state. In time, the uproar would die down. And in time, the states would comply with the decisions. The problem arose in that uh, harvest was allowed off the coast. Uh, harvest was allowed in uh, the zones one through five below Bonneville Dam. Uh, and typically with every run, as the run began to approach the Treaty Indian fishing area, uh, the states would declare that there were no surplus fish, that all of the available fish for harvest had already been caught and that there would be no Treaty Indian fishing. And so the uh, practice at the time uh, was for the tribes to go back to court uh, after U.S. versus Oregon was filed in that case uh, to challenge that closure uh, and uh, typically there would be a finding that uh, uh, there should have been some fish allowed to escape to the treaty fishing area, but uh, that hadn't happened and now the, the run could not be fished on. And so the tribes would win a legal victory and, and lose the practical battle. It became clear to Judge Baloney that any long-term harvest management solution would require that all parties to the case work together. To that end, he ordered the development of the Columbia River Fish Management Plan. That plan would be of particular significance to the tribes. The Columbia River Fish Management Plan was a document of historic proportion. It provided the tribes time to catch up with the technical knowledge that was being developed about salmon fisheries. It formalized government-to-government -government relationships among the parties involved in Columbia River salmon management, and it enabled the tribes to begin a very constructive dialogue with non-Indians as to how best to serve the salmon, who were so dependent upon us at this time to provide for the appropriate habitat, to provide for all of the other conditions upon which their survival would depend. The dialogue between Indians and non-Indians over salmon survival must continue. And it must also extend beyond the U.S. versus Oregon arena. The primary threat to Indian fishing rights is no longer discriminatory harvest allocation. The threat is to the salmon runs themselves, without which the rights are meaningless. When the federal government negotiated treaties, it pledged the word of the nation to uphold its promises to the Columbia River Indian people. Now far from upholding those promises, its own actions and policies, past and present, 
may pose the greatest threat to treaty guaranteed fishing rights. The treaty fishing rights will endure forever, but it will require the immense effort of the Indian and non-Indian fishers to see that there are fish in the river so that the treaty rights will continue to produce fish for ceremonial subsistence and commercial uses. Obviously, treaty rights are meaningless if there are no fish to catch. It doesn't matter who's regulating the tribal members. If there are no fish there, uh, it's, uh, it's a pointless exercise. Uh, the impact of, of federal development, federal hydropower development in particular, uh, the inadequacy of mitigation efforts, uh, trust responsibility principles, how they come into play in that, that, uh, in that area are now more and more the, uh, the focus of the tribes efforts. It's going to take a, a complex, uh, comprehensive, multi-pronged strategy to, to counteract the, the effects of a hundred or more years of, of federal development on the Columbia system and what effect that, that huge development has had on, on the resource itself, the subject matter of the treaty rights, the fish rights. The United States cannot deny that it has an obligation to not only attempt best effort in managing the resource, they must actually take responsibility for the decline and the loss and the future conditions that they are providing to Indian people. That means that they must be held responsible for those things that we see as a serious decline, as an immeasurable loss to the salmon resource. It is up to the United States, because of their management philosophies over the years, to make good upon the loss of those resources. For the federal government, truly acknowledging the full extent of its solemn treaty promises to the Columbia River Indian people is the first step toward ensuring healthy salmon runs and ensuring the nation lives up to its word. The loss to the Indians would be impossible to calculate. The loss to the United States would be the loss of a large part of a great culture and the loss of our credibility and honor. We would have breached a solemn promise to an important segment of our people.